Hello. Hi. Welcome. Welcome. Hope everyone is enjoying everything so far. Chord feature and everything. I think that part's pretty cool. I like seeing all those pictures. And the music's good. Um, so welcome to Rococo and the Revolution. Um, my name is Nicole. I also go by Nicole Ghost on a lot of my social media, including Twitch. And I also go by La Vie Don Le Noir on Instagram. Uh, you guys can talk to me throughout this. You can ask me questions and discuss things. I will um, try to like talk to you, but I don't know how long this is going to last. Every time I rehearsed it, it seems like it was a different amount of time. <laughs> so depending on how much content I think I've, I say is how long it ends up being. Um, but yeah, you can ask me questions, whatever you want. I did a lot of research on this. I read five books on this, so I know quite a lot, but I am not an expert and I still learn about this like all the time. Every time I read something, I always end up learning something new. So, um, I might not know something if you ask a question. So what is Rococo? Rococo is a type of art that emerged in 1600s France based on very ornate and elaborate curves and designs. The name comes from the word rocaille, which is a form of decoration using rocks, pebbles, seashells, and cement. And then people began to carve these designs and incorporate vines and leaves to create the Rococo style. Um, as you can see here, this right here is Rococo. Um, the name is mostly meant to refer to furniture art and architecture. That's because historians don't really care that much about fashion. Um, fashion, art, fashion history is kind of a niche thing. So when, when historians are talking about stuff, they don't really mention fashion that much, which doesn't really make sense because fashion influences a lot of events and politics. And it did influence the French Revolution as well, which is what we're going to get to. But um, yeah, most of the time when people talk about Rococo, they're not talking about the fashion. It's more like an interior design kind of thing. So Rococo fashion, the main difference between Baroque and Rococo is that Baroque uses a lot of rich, dark colors and Rococo uses more light colors. Um, also, Baroque is a little bit more structural and Rococo is a little bit more, I don't know, flowy, like feminine. <laughs> um, those are the main differences. Um, another thing is that Rococo didn't just exist in France. It existed pretty much all over Europe. Um, so Baroque is a little more popular in certain places where they had colder temperatures. And um, that's, that's mainly the main difference because Rococo is a little bit more light. Um, so Rococo fashion also was heavily influenced by Asian and Middle Eastern cultures. And that's why we see the wide sleeves and that's reminiscent of Chinese and Japanese robes and kimono. Flower and vine motifs are, uh, that were also influenced by Chinese and Japanese clothing and art and abundant use of silk because France was a big trader with China. Um, other prominent culture pieces found in Rococo were turbans and the use of large ostrich feathers. Um, ostriches obviously being from Africa. Casual dresses also utilize large sashes on the waist that were influenced by Japanese obi, which I will show you in a minute. Um, this right here is Madame Pompadour, also known as Madame Duberry. Um, <laughs> Ray yesterday would not shut the fuck up about how she, this person that she knew who was married to whoever, whatever, whatever, Mary Magdalene, but she was talking about Madame Pompadour. <laughs> Madame Pompadour was a huge, huge fashion icon at the time um, because she was the mistress of King Louis the Fifteenth. Um, who is, King Louis the Fifteenth is the predecessor to King Louis the Sixteenth. And King Louis the Sixteenth is married to Marie Antoinette. But yes, so Madame Pompadour, who is also named Madame Du Barry, 
she was his mistress and she loved clothing and she was just a huge, huge uh, fashion icon for the time and very trendy. Um, so here I'm uh, showing you the influence from Japanese and Chinese culture, the, you know, flowers and plants on this print here. And uh, this, I'm sorry, this is not a print, pattern. Um, and then this dress here, this is a chemise dress, which I will cover later uh, what a chemise dress is. But um, chemise dresses were kind of lighter dresses. And you can see here she has the sash on her waist, which also was tied in the back like a bow, just like an obi. I mean, obi aren't usually done that way, but, you know, tied in the back. <laughs> All right, so here. How do you wear Rococo dress? Um, so the Rococo era was the beginning of the toilet, which uh, last night I kind of started to think that this is this word is actually pronounced toilet. So I'm not sure if that's pronounced right. But anyways, this means to transform the face and body for maximum desirability. Um, so basically it means getting ready and looking your best. Um, the word comes from petit toil, which is a little, literally it means little cloth. And that was the cloth that you put underneath all of your cosmetics or whatever you were, you know, your things that you were getting ready, your perfumes and boxes and things. Um, so pain nor were worn over clothing during toilet, um, while you were getting ready. So it didn't, your, your makeup and stuff didn't mess up your clothing. Uh, Rococo's main focus was exuberance and elaborance. Pieces were heavily decorated with ruffles, bows, lace, embroidery, scalloping, quilting, and pleating. Um, I chose this dress here because it had a lot of this stuff going on here. Um, fabrics in use were linen, silk, cotton, and occasionally wool, and occasionally made into brocade and damask. Uh, wool Silk was the main fabric used in France uh, that was considered like the French fabric. Um, other places that were more cold, like um, Austria <laughs> or, or something like that. Um, yeah, that had, they used more wool there. And I know that British colonies and British, British, you know, influenced places used more cotton. Um, a full, oh, uh, uh, real quick. I didn't know this, but apparently linen is made with wheat fibers and not cotton. I thought linen was actually a different kind of cotton. So I learned that as well. <laughs> a full ensemble is consisted of several layers, starting with a slip called the chemise. Um, so that was just like an underdress, a slip pretty much. And it protected your clothing from your body like the oils and your sweat and your funk. Um, because most women, you know, this this clothing was very expensive and most women only had maybe like one or two dresses. And if you were pretty well off, maybe had 20. Um, so, and they were all custom made and it was hard to wash clothing at this time. So you had to kind of really protect your clothing from everything elements and yourself. Um, over the chemise was an underskirt. Oh, I'm sorry. Before I continue, the chemise was like kind of sleeved. Like, I don't think it was to this part of your arm, but it was like this part, a short sleeve shirt dress. I'm sorry. And um, it went down to your knees. Um, and then over the chemise, you wore a, uh, thank you. I'm sorry. You're right. It is flax. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. Um, I like spaced on that for a second there. Um, anyways, oh, so over the chemise was um, is an underskirt. And that was, um, okay, so I couldn't really find a lot of info on this, but I don't think that people really wore underwear at this time. And so um, the underskirt was really just to protect your modesty in case your skirt got ridden up somehow. Um, so it was like ankle length usually your underskirt and it was pretty tight fitted. Um, over your underskirt, you would put your stays, which is also called the corset. Um, and then on the top of the 
corset, you would have a piece of fabric called a stomacher, which was pinned onto your corset. And then on top of that, you would put paneer, which is tied over your waist. And then you'd have the, um, okay, I mixed it up on this panel and I keep forgetting that I had, I didn't change it. But anyways, then you would have your skirt, which this ensemble here has the skirt here. And then um, you would have your mantle, which is this part here. The mantle is kind of like a jacket. So it does, it's open in the front and the front part pins to the stomacher part. This part right here, the bodice part and the skirt part of the mantle are not always uh, connected. This part sometimes doesn't exist and it's just the skirt. Um, sometimes it's this part and this, the skirt all put together. So <laughs> there's that. What, what do you mean by this? Because paneer and petticoat, those are kind of synonymous. Um, and I will elaborate more on the paneer. Um, so yeah. OK, so in this slide here, I'm showing you a picture of the stomacher here. And then we have here the stomacher being pinned onto the, the corset and then the manto being pinned onto the stomacher. And this here, um, so a lot of dresses, because people only had like one or two dresses, they had lacing in the back, like corset lacing in the back, like Lolita does. And this right here is called Watteau pleats that would cover up the lacing that you had in the back. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the stays, um, which is also known as the corset. Uh, men and women at the time both wore corsets or stays. Uh, women wore corsets even when they were pregnant, which when I read this originally, I was like, dang, that sucks, like being pregnant and wearing a corset. But then when I actually saw the corset, it doesn't really look like it covers up the belly too much. It's really just the top part of your bosom, I suppose. <laughs> um uh, the, the only person, uh, the queen, did have to wear a slightly different stay. Um, hers actually was a little more stiff, and it had a little bit of a sleeve, um, and apparently was super, super uncomfortable and hard to wear. Um, the main reason people wore corsets was to attain a sleek shape so that your clothes kind of laid down per perfectly. So it was so tight that you didn't, you know, weren't messing stuff up by moving around. Um, and the other main, main, main reason was really just for posture, because if you had a bent back, um, um, okay, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read the chat. <laughs> okay, first of all, hi, thank you. <laughs> Are we supposed to be seeing a slide? Um, you should be saying, seeing um, the corset slide. Okay, hold on. Let me stop the screen and then share again. Share. Okay, do you guys see the corset slide? Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, so now back to this. Did you did anybody see um, the slide before this? Do I need to go back to that one, which was explaining the the stomacher or showing you the stomacher and the um the other thing, the, the Watto pleats, how to wear. Okay, so let's go back. Oops, my bad. Okay, stomacher. Stomacher and, <laughs> all right, are we back on, we're back on the stomacher and the Watto pleats. Here's the stomacher. Here's the stomacher pinned. Y'all see this? 
or is it still stuck? Okay, cool. Yeah, so that's the stomacher, that little piece of fabric there. And then we got the, the stomacher pinned onto the corset with the, the manto pinned onto that. And then the image on the left is the Watto pleating, which covers up the lacing on the back. Are we good? Can I continue? <laughs> back onto the back onto the stays. <laughs> um, okay, so back onto the stays. Um, so the main reason that people wore corsets was to keep a good posture. Um, the the reason for this was if you had bad posture, if you had a bent back, that just means that you did a lot of labor. Um, so that was why people wore corsets. So corsets for the less wealthy were laced in the front and corsets for aristocracy was laced in the back. Um, the reason for this was because people that had less money can lace it up themselves and people that had more money had servants that can lace it up for them. Um, and it was looped through with just one cord. Uh, stays were not uncomfortable or suffocating because they were custom made and most people did not tight lace their corsets. So I think that most people actually liked to wear their corset because they were so used to it. Um, with the exception of the queen because hers was so, so tight, not tight, uh, stiff. So the paneer, now we're, now we're on to the paneer. <laughs> So hoop skirts became popular at this time to achieve a bigger shape to hide a pregnant belly. Um, the biggest petticoats were used for formal occasions and smaller hoops were made for more casual wear. Um, so here are these two slides you can see. Okay, wait, can everybody see? Uh, can everybody see the slide? <laughs> I just wanna make sure it's not frozen again. Before I start talking about, uh... okay, cool, cool, cool. All right. All right. So yes, this slide, here, this petticoat here would be for a really formal occasion, like a ball or something like that party. This one here, these are the pocket hoops and these would be for something more casual, like just hanging out at home, being Marie Antoinette and pretending you're a commoner, <laughs> which I learned yesterday. Um, the biggest petticoats. Okay. The shape used at this time was mainly a large hip and it was called pocket hoops. So this right here is pocket, the pocket hoops. Um, and the pocket hoops did have actual pockets in them. As you can see on this one here, this was like, they didn't have that. They didn't put it in their one, but this one, for example, would have it. And the manto does have slits cut into the skirt of it. So that way you can go into your pockets. Um, so both corsets and hoop skirts were structured with whale bones. When I was doing a lot of the research for this, and um, I'm sorry, uh, when I was doing a lot of research for this, I kept coming across this word, the word baleen to kind of mean corsets, or I think that baleen means corset or it's interchangeable with corset or it's interchangeable with the word boning. Um, so all of this would have been boned with whalebone. Your corset would also have been boned with whalebone. <clears throat> so baleen apparently they just named it the animal. <laughs> um, underskirts were used on top of the hoop skirts to hide the boning. Um, so that's where we get like our fluffy petticoats that we have. Um, and yeah, back to what this person was saying that, yeah, <laughs> they're pretty much, they're the same thing. They're just a different shape. Uh, okay. I didn't know that. I thought baleen was a type of whale. So baleen is whale bone. It's the feeding structure. And okay. Oh, okay. Okay. You're right. You're right. Oh, sorry. Mario knows everything about animals. All right. So let's go to hair and makeup. Towers of curls and pompadour poofs were very common hairstyles. Pompadour obviously being from Madame Pompadour. Uh, hairstyles were created with pomade made with animal fat, clove oil, and citrus oils, and sometimes they also contain bee wa beeswax. I had read this article, which I don't really think this person who wrote this article did a lot of research, but they had said that 
with the animal fat in their hair, it uh, attracted bugs. That is not true. Um, because it had the citrus oil and the clove oil in it, it actually prevented bugs in the hair. It was, um, the, the use of this was actually more to prevent lice in your hair, to be honest. Um, to help protect and style the hair, women also used hair powder made of wheat starch, um, which we will get to later, the wheat starch thing. Um, and women did not normal, no, they didn't wear wigs very often. They normally had their own hair that they used um, because it was like you were, as a woman, you had to have like very nice lustrous hair. Only men wore um, wigs at the time. Women did wear hair pieces, but it was still their own hair. It was just hair that came from their brush or they bought it from a peasant or something like that. Many intricate styles were made with wire structures. Um, so there's this really famous illustration of a woman that has like a ship in her hair. And that was made with a wire structure. That was actually real. It was like that actually happened. And she would like, she they like wrapped her hair around the wire. Um, hair accessories included bows, flowers, feathers, precious stones. I didn't put it on here, but hats as well and even miniature paintings. And I thought that was funny because that is so like OTT classic Lolita, seriously. <laughs> um, makeup emphasized the paleness of the skin with heavy powder, um, dark brows and rosy cheeks, cheeks and lips with rouge. Um, other than that, women didn't really wear that much makeup at this time. It was really just powder, rouge, and then like a little bit of darkening of your eyebrow. And again, the, the powder was made with wheat starch. Um, so moosh, we're on to the moosh. Uh, Jessica started saying something about this yesterday. Um, so moosh are, oh, okay, wait, wait, before I say this, moosh are, is the French word for fly um, because these are little beauty marks on your face, the little black beauty marks. And they thought that the, black looked like a fly on your face. <laughs> um, and they were used to cover blemishes, pox marks, scars, acne. Um, some, some men would wear a pretty big ones to cover up like scars from battle and stuff. And it was usually considered very like heroic to have a really big moosh on your face if you're a man. Dark spots accentuated the paleness of the skin and was thought to look youthful. Most patches were made of fabric and were sometimes in shapes like stars, hearts, diamonds, and crescents. I tried to find paintings that had them in those weird shapes, but I couldn't really find any. So I don't really think it was super, super popular to have it in different shapes. I think most people just wore the, a little dot. Um, the, um, let me read your comments. Hold on. The American Duchess Guide to 18th Century Beauty has some recipes for hair powder and pomade hairstyles. It was an interesting book. Okay, actually, that's the book that I read. <laughs> that's how I learned about that. <laughs> so that's funny. Um, and it is a good book, by the way. It's very, very uh, well made. And um, they even have sections there where you have different hair textures, like if you have African hair or like it has a little excerpt from um, an African-American woman that was talks about like how black people did their hair during the time as well. So I thought it was like, the book was amazing. Um, sometimes the placement of the moosh was, uh, had a symbolic meaning. I think that this is debatable because I've honestly, I tried to find what the meanings meant depending on like if you put it on your cheek or your lip or wherever that but every single thing i read did didn't align with anything else so i don't know if this was true or if like if it was just something that people assumed now that it's all over or if um like it just was something more personal and it just had a meaning to you so i don't know about that one um, and moosh were kept in boxes and carried around in compacts. So if you had your toilet, you had your little moosh box, which is also called the fly box. Um, and you had like a little, 
a vial of glue and you would like put that on your mush dot and stick that on your face. And if you needed to reapply during the day, you had your compact. So this um, image here that has this, this thing, that's kind of like something that would be in your compact and it has adhesive already on there. Um, this was uh, an illustration that was basically kind of saying like, this is a fad. <laughs> And and some people overdo this fad, which was true. Actually, the mamouche wasn't super, super popular for a long time. I think it only lasted around 100 years, which at the time was not a super long time. By the time Marie Antoinette came around, it uh, kind of started dying away. I couldn't really find a lot of uh, paintings where people were still wearing mouche at Marie Antoinette's time. It kind of started going away because as as Jessica was saying yesterday, a lot of women that wore a lot of different mouche were considered to be trashy or lower class because they were probably prostitutes and they were probably covering up syphilis scars. So it really kind of just became in poor taste to wear it anymore. Sorry, my cat is zooming. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it was definitely something that was more popular at the beginning of the Rococo era and not so much at the end. Um, but mouche was something that people wore throughout history. It apparently started in Roman times. So, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so the inspiration for Lolita. Lolita's most obvious inspiration from Rococo was the big dramatic bell-shaped dresses. The other obvious inspiration are details like pastel colors, bows, ruffles, lace, florals, and pleating. Lolita focuses on high quality luxurious items, luxurious items and exorbitant and attention to detail. Aside from prominent cleavage, Rococo fashion had every part of the body covered, including a headpiece and stocking, stockings. Um, so uh, the, I chose this dress here because I thought this dress looked very inspired by Rococo. A lot of old school dresses do look very inspired by Rococo more so than some a lot of the modern dresses. I don't know what this dress is. Um, you guys might know. I don't know. Like old school dresses, like how do you even know what the name of it is? I just, anyways. Um, so the reason I chose this again, because I think it's very inspired by Rococo. It has this panel in the front. So reminiscent of like having a stomacher and the, the manteau on top. Um, and then it has the ruffles here, it has the bows um, and all of that. Uh, this septum piercing I'm wearing is a little too small for me. So it really dangles around everywhere. <laughs> um, I'm gonna change it after this. <laughs> Less obvious inspiration for Lolita is uh, the back lacing part, which I had mentioned earlier. That was also part of Rococo dresses and was often covered by a draper pleated fabric, pleated fabric called Watteau pleats. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty sure that the corsetting on the back of a, a Lolita dress is inspired by that. Early Lolita incorporated lace chokers and crisscross neckties. Ribbon around the neck was a popular Rococo accessory. Um, back at the beginning, we had a, that painting of Madame Pompadour and she was wearing a ribbon around her neck. The square neckline used in Lolita is very, very largely inspired by Rococo. Um, I chose this dress because it has that square neckline. And I think most Lolita dresses do have the square neckline um, because I think that it looks a little more like Lolita than if you had, you know, a different neckline. It might look a little more like... Um, like what's the word rockabilly <laughs> or like 50s fashion so I, I think that's why lolita uses still the the square neckline really well and the and in rococo it used the it's because they had this corset kind of pop come off right here and then you had your manteau so it did make a square um but it wasn't like they intentionally had square necklines in rococo um Early Lolita did not incorporate a lot of printing like it does now. Originally, Lolita mainly used embroidery, and if it fe featured a pattern at all, um, which I think also was partly because of Rococo. Um, early Lolita also had a heavily heavy focus on natural fibers like cotton. 
Um, so other less obvious inspiration is when printing in Lolita did start, a very common theme in printing was to use strips, stripes or columns of patterns like you can see on this one here. Um, this is still pretty popular now, but as you can see here, this was something that they did in Rococo as well, this kind of printing. Not printing, patterning, because <laughs> they didn't have printed clothing then. Scalloping and pleating, pleated ruffles and the hemline daisy. Sorry, my cat. <laughs> Scalloping and pleated ruffles and the hemline were common for Rococo dresses, which I'll show you in a minute. And, and although most paneer at the time were square in shape, um, that was the most popular shape, they did use other shapes and they did use the cupcake shape. Um, and I'll show you that here, cupcake shape. Which this is like very cupcake shape. This looks like a damn cupcake. Um, this dress, oh, this dress here. <laughs> I put this dress here because it has the scalloping at the bottom and it has this ruffles underneath. This dress here also has the scalloping at the bottom and ruffles underneath. And so uh, I just was doing a little compare there. I'm going through this way faster than I thought I was going to, <laughs> but that's okay. I don't know why one time it took me like an hour and like 15 minutes to go through all of this. I don't even know what I was talking about that time. <laughs> so this is a quick history lesson before we get onto the revolution part and how Rococo led to the revolution. Um, this is other factors that led to the revolution um, just to kind of give you a little bit more um, info on the atmosphere at the time. So what started the Rococo era was that France uh, was led into this culture of abundance, which was started by King Louis XIV. He pushed for this type of art in order to strengthen France's economy and trade. Uh, French art and fashion was all the rage all over the world. Previously, Spain was the leader in fashion and luxury goods. Um, and this was a really huge part of it because, um, yeah, and at the time, if everybody wanted something from France, everybody wanted French clothing, French perfumes, French shoes, French made this, French made that, French furniture, like everybody wanted something French. And so everybody wanted to trade with France. And that was a huge, huge deal. And it made a huge boom in their economy for that reason. Um, and that was partly why they became such a kind of powerhouse um, country is because they want to do this. Uh, the French had animosity for Austria. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Actually, let me let me kind of go into this one a little bit more. I did that one pretty basic because this was a very long story. <laughs> so before before Marie Antoinette became the queen, she, there was a war between Austria and a country called Prussia, which does not exist anymore. And they were fighting over lands, like over Germanic states in Europe. And Austria lost. Um, so after that war, shortly after, Austria was lost a piece of land called Serbia, which they really wanted back. And so they went back to war with Prussia and during the second time they were in a war, which was called the Seven Years War, um, Austria aligned with France and Prussia aligned with Britain. And Britain had a really, really, really good Navy at the time and they beat the crap out of everyone. <laughs> and because of this, we had, they made the Treaty of Paris, which ended up with France losing all of their colonies to Britain. And that included Canada and India, which if you're not American, you probably didn't know that, that Canada and India were once owned by France. If you are not American, uh, you probably didn't know that. Apparently I've, I've, I've come to know that like every American that I've told this story to did not know that Canada was originally owned by Fr uh, France which is why we there's French Canada. <laughs> I mean, it's very obvious now, but I 
guess we just we don't learn about other people in America because we're rude. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, because France lost all of their colonies. No, no. I seriously told so many people this <laughs> and so many people did not know that. <laughs> Oh, I didn't, we don't even have that kind of class at the, the school that I went to. We just had a general world history class. I know that Canadians would know this. <laughs> and I told a, a British friend of this once too, and he was like, yeah. And I was like, okay, well, Americans don't learn this, okay? <laughs> um, um, what was I going to say about this? Uh... I lost my train of thought now. Oh, because because France lost their colonies to Britain, the French people had a lot of animosity for Austria because they blamed Austria for that. Um, so uh, just in case you didn't know, Marie Antoinette was Austrian, so they didn't like her right out of the gate for that. Um, so the French court focused very heavily on etiquette and show. There was a lot of pomp and circumstance because French people were allowed to enter Versailles and watch the royal court do everything from change and eat. And we learned that yesterday with Ray's panel um, about how people would come in and be able to see what the king did. And this was a big deal because if people weren't able to see what was happening in the court and they weren't able to know like, hey, I'm not making as much money as these people are. I'm not able to do this stuff. Um, can you guys? Um, I'll try refreshing again. Hi again. <laughs> Can you guys see me now? Okay, sorry that I keep having technical difficulties. I think uh, I think it has to do with my internet. I've been having really bad internet all, all weekend. Um, so I'm sorry that I live in a forest <laughs> and I have bad internet here. It's not my fault. Um, I don't know where I was at. I guess I could start again where the pomp and circumstance, people being able to see what was going on? Is that where I was at? Do I need to start all over? Okay. <laughs> um, so, okay. Yeah, so people were allowed to see what was going on with the king and commoners were allowed to enter Versailles. And that was a huge deal and why a lot of this, um, the revolution happened because they were able to see Marie Antoinette and see that you know, make rumors about her and they were able to, um, we're really on the, were you guys really stopped at animosity for Austria? I was done with that. They had animosity for Austria, <laughs> but yeah, they were able to see, uh, like the King and the queen and what was going on. And, um, that, that created, that led a lot to the French revolution because rumors and because, they resentment pretty much. France aligned with the United States during the US War for Independence, the US Revolution. Um, this was a huge deal. Um, and like France kind of had to align with the US during this time because they were rivals with Britain. But um, 
because of this, they had to raise the taxes on the French people to, sh to support the U.S. And the French people were not happy about that. They were very upset and rightfully so. They were already poor and starving. And I didn't, I meant to come back to this at a certain point, but yeah, people were poor and starving and they, there was a wheat shortage and um, people they weren't able to eat bread anymore. So that was the whole thing with like Marie Antoinette supposedly saying, let them eat cake, which she actually never said, but she um, like people like didn't have food and P the aristocracy was still wearing lots of heavy powder and hair, hair powder and stuff like that. And that comes from wheat starch. Like, you know, there's a shortage of food and you guys are putting this shit in your hair. It's pretty fucked up. <laughs> does my does my pen, my slide still work since nothing works in my house? I'll read your little comment here. I didn't know any of the history when I watched the Sofia Coppola Marie Antoinette movie, and it's not really explained in the movie, so I was confused mostly there for the aesthetic. That's so true. If you don't know anything about Marie Antoinette's life, that movie is so confusing. And it's really kind of boring, to be honest. <laughs> um, so I get you. I I only I thought I had watched the first time after I had read all these books, and so I knew exactly what it was going on the whole time. But I can see that if you didn't know what was going on, like if you don't already know the history, then this it was just like very confusing, very weird. Um, because there really isn't like a, a plot line. It's just she's kind of fucking around the whole time. <laughs> That's really true, though. Okay, so Marie Antoinette, the only purpose of a queen in French court was to provide an heir to the throne. King Louis XVI was overly shy and did not consummate the marriage for seven years. Yesterday, we kind of concluded that King Louis XVI, who is also known as King Louis Auguste, was probably asexual, which is probably why he didn't have um, interest in having sex. Um uh okay yeah i agree <laughs> when you know the context that scene is pretty messed up yeah that's true um marie antoinette um this part i forgot to mention was actually marie antoinette helps lead to the french revolution with her fashion um i mean yeah you're right <laughs> <laughs> that's that's technically why we do Lolita. Um, so yeah, so uh, people uh, weren't really like they didn't have a lot of confidence in Marie Antoinette because she hadn't produced an heir yet, and that's also not really her fault because we all know that did did you want to fuck her? It's like it's, I feel bad for her. <laughs> Um, okay, so because Marie Antoinette was foreign born, she didn't know or understand certain etiquette or cultural procedures. And sometimes she would act out of line or what some people considered childish. So people would start a lot of rumors about her because they, she would say something that people were like, uh, what the heck? And, or she would do something that people were like, don't do that. Sometimes she would give people hugs, which was super not part of etiquette. People didn't really vibe with Marie Antoinette's behavior that much. She was a little bit kind of free spirited, I suppose. So specifically her fashion faux pas that led to the French Revolution. Um, King Louis the 16th did not don a mistress like his predecessors and therefore he granted that allowance to Marie Antoinette. Um, as we had already mentioned that King Louis Auguste was probably asexual. And so he really didn't have an interest in having a, a mistress for that reason. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, reading the chat that you guys said that boning <laughs> was was uh, not happy, was not <laughs> um, a word that was accepted. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, because, yeah, because uh, King Louis Auguste didn't have a mistress, 
he gave that money to Marie Antoinette. And when people saw that, for, they had even more resentment for her because she, they thought that she was just spending money for no reason. They thought that she was like living too lavishly and they really, really resented that. So Marie Antoinette was very provocative in the way that she dressed, according to the French people. At one time, she wore trousers to horseback ride, which uh, apparently horseback riding wasn't really something that women did at the time, or at least in France. Um, it, she learned how to horseback ride, despite people telling her not to learn how to horseback ride. And then when she did, she commissioned an outfit so that it was easier for her to be on the horse, which included trousers. The top part of it was still very feminine and like, it looked like a regular dress, but the bottom part was trousers. And I want to say she only wore that like maybe once or twice because it was so, so like not well accepted. Accepted. It was, uh, it wasn't even like only a few people ever commented on it and um, there aren't any drawings or anything of it. So I really want to say that she only wore it once or twice because she was like told not to do wear it again. <laughs> um, the she, uh, at one point she also refused her corset which again the queen's corset was very very strict and um, wrist, like unmoving and so she didn't like wearing it but she had to wear it and a lot of that was a big deal for people was that she didn't she didn't wear her corset for a while <laughs> that was actually in the movie at one point I think was it? I don't remember now that I'm thinking about it. I don't know if I just read that and then I just assumed it was in the movie or I just like filled in the gaps in my brain. But yeah. Um, so uh, a big thing that she did was she unveiled a portrait of herself wearing a chemise gown, which is this portrait right here. And again, if you remember from the beginning, chemise is underwear. Chemise is a very, very thin cotton fabric and um this you know this was technically like she was wearing lingerie also remember that silk was the french fabric cotton was a british fabric so she was kind of like it was almost disrespectful to the french to see her wearing cotton um especially in a portrait and especially in an unveiling of a portrait um so that this painting right here made so many people really fucking mad when they saw this. Um, I don't know if she started the trend of the chemise gown and it went out into like the Caribbean, like Havana and stuff, um, because people, women in the, the Caribbean did wear these gowns and, I, and it's really lightweight. So that's why she wanted to wear it because it was very nice and like comfortable and not too hot. Um, so I don't know if she was influenced by people in the Caribbean or if people in the Caribbean were influenced by her. It probably was her that started this trend, though. Um, so, be so because she spent so much money on her clothing and her appearance and all that, she became known as Madame Deficit due to spending so much on her clothing. She had over 300 dresses, which, again, if you remember, people really only had like two or three 20 tops dresses. Um, she had an original hairstyle, she had an exclusive fragrance, um, and, and so people just didn't like that she was spending so much money on herself, basically. Um, another thing that happened was she, there was a mix up with a jeweler, in which we heard the story yesterday by Ashley, um, <clears throat> I'll go over the story again. I, she had just a couple of things wrong in the story, but that's okay. It was basically the same story. Um, the story is that there was a jeweler that made a really extravagant necklace that he wanted to sell to Madame Pompadour, but Madame Pompadour did not want it and the king didn't buy it for her. So then when Marie Antoinette came on, he wanted to sell that necklace to Marie Antoinette. But Marie Antoinette didn't want the necklace, and she told King Louis Gus to sell to use that money for the Navy, to better the Navy. And then 
the jeweler, because he had already made this necklace, he was like, I don't know what the fuck to do with this shit. So he just sold it to this woman who was in a lot of debt and she was going to sell it for parts um, in order to pay off her debt. But um, basically there was a bunch of rumors that went around that's that Marie Antoinette had the necklace and didn't want to pay for it. And Marie Antoinette didn't know anything about this necklace. And then the jeweler started demanding his money for the necklace, but he, you know, then that didn't, it didn't appear because the woman still had that necklace. And because of all this fiasco and all these rumors going around um, and the jeweler demanding his money, the king arrested the jeweler for, I believe, fraud or something like that, just because he was causing a scandal. Like, he was like, get, get that guy in my face. But um, so, yeah, they arrested the jeweler. And that was kind of like the final straw. One of the final straws for the French people was because they thought that Marie Antoinette was trying to steal this necklace without paying for it. And um, that's what happened. She got beheaded. <laughs> Oh, another thing about her fragrance, I want to say that um, people were able to find her when she was hiding during the revolt, um, during the, you know, the rebellion, the, the pro, what is it, the pro, riot, riot, there you go. Um, yeah, people were able to find her because of her exclusive fragrance. She wore it pretty heavily, so they were able to sniff her out. <laughs> That's sad, though. All right, so onto the Harajuku Revolution and why these things kind of go together. And I, I want to say it's more like not go together, but there's parallels only in the way that they're kind of opposite um, things of each other. The French Revolution, as we just heard, happened because Fran French people were tired of seeing aristocracy, spending so much money and living so lavishly and just being very selfish. Japanese culture is the opposite of that. Japanese culture puts a lot of pressure on people to conform, be practical, be efficient, don't draw attention to yourself. And women are meant to be submissive and demure. A Harajuku fashion was a rebellion against these social norms. Um, so instead of being practical and efficient and being small and uh, blending in with your background, the Harajuku uh, revolution happened because people wanted to be loud. They wanted to be seen. They wanted to draw attention to themselves. They wanted to have a lot of intricate things going on, a lot of lavishness. They wanted to spend money on themselves and they wanted to like be a little bit selfish. And that's fine. Like sometimes you can be a little bit selfish. It's that's self care, you know? And a lot of the, you know, Lolita is very expensive especially compared to other fashions. So we're spending a lot of money on ourselves and that's awesome. Honestly, do, do it. If you have the money, then do it. <laughs> and if you want to, then do it. You know what I'm saying? And um, another thing about Lolita is that we, like the activities that are commonly associated with Lolita, like tea parties and stuff is also pretty expensive and that's fine. <laughs> Sometimes we just wanna have fun. That's fine. We want candy. Um, EGL is also more for the wearer and the community. It's not so much to draw attention from outside of the community. So we're really just like focusing on ourselves. It's all self-care and we all are like uh, just trying to express ourselves in a way that is fun, I guess. I don't know. I don't know how to explain that part. Hella, everyone should wear Lolita. Yeah. Lolita's fun and it's it's it is definitely a self a way of self-care, I think, you know. So, anyways, that's my panel. That's my panel. I hope everyone's still here and still alive. <laughs> Sorry for all the technical difficulties. Um, we have like five minutes left if anybody has any questions. And also there's my Instagram handle, La Vida on the Fort Noir, if you want to follow me. I yelled at my dog this morning, so I kind of hurt my voice. <laughs> um, she was eating garbage, though. She was she was eating a dead animal, 
And so I yelled at her and I'm the, I'm a pretty uh, quiet person. So that was like a lot of strain on my voice. And so my voice is kind of hurting now because of all this. Thank you, everyone. So nice of you. No questions? It kind of went pretty in depth, so I don't know if there will be questions. <clears throat> it really is, though. I keep saying, I said in the beginning that I, every time I learn something else about Rococo, I learn something new. Like, I've already, I've read five books. I watched so many videos. I watched documentaries, and I'm still learning new stuff about this all the time. I watched this documentary about food in the Rococo era. I mean, I watched a lot of stuff. I'm not even kidding. I did so much research for this. <laughs> I was thorough as hell. I mean, that's what happens. That's what happens. <clears throat> did everybody, did everybody enjoy Virgil Versailles, all your panels so far? What's your favorite panel? What's your, what panels are you looking forward to? What, have you bought anything? Have you um, uh, done the scavenger hunt? Oh, also, please donate to us. We, we're trying to do, um, we're trying to do a, a real life event, a real life Rococo themed event next year uh, called Rosé Foray. That's our main event. That's what we're doing this in the first place. We're doing a three day long con and, um, not, okay, it's not a convention, I guess. It's more just a, a gala. Um, but yeah, donate to us if you want to uh, support us and support the convention. And if you want to come, it's uh, this time next year in Denver, Colorado. Um, okay, so uh, um, what, what would you be able to post some of the sources? Yes, okay. I know, I saw you guys saying this. I was just ranting. Um, yeah, I can post the sources. I'll post it right here in the comments. Um, all right, never mind. I have to, <laughs> I can't quite remember all of them. I know that one is Queen of Fashion. Uh, I don't know the authors, I'm sorry. One of them was, shit. Can't remember. I'm sorry, Al, I have to, if you guys are fall, are in the Rosé Ferre events group, I will give you the sources there. Um, if you're not in the Rosé Foray events group on Facebook, um, join it so that you can find this out. Cause I seriously, I have to go look at the coffee table. They're all, they're all still sitting on the coffee table. <laughs> there is like so many books that I, oh, I know one of them was a uh, crinoline and corsets. Corsets and crinoline or something like that. I can't remember if it was corsets and crinoline or crinoline and corsets. That was one of them. Um, I want to say one of them was just like straight up 18th century fat French fashion. And there was one more on Marie Antoinette somehow. And then there was that book about um, like historical costuming. I kind of thought that you read that one, Jamie, because some of the information that you said in one of your videos about um, hoop skirts sounded like it came from that book. <laughs> and Jamie just dropped the link for the uh, event page. The Rosé Ferre events group um, on Facebook. So yeah, I will I will post my sources there. Okay. Sorry, I'm yeah. dumb. I should have I should have uh I should have put that in my slideshow here. I don't know why I didn't cite my sources. <laughs> yeah, I actually didn't read the whole book either. I only read the parts that were um that were specifically about the six uh, 17th century. I'm sorry, 18th century um fashion not so much like the other parts because there was so many you know centuries that it was covering and a lot of it seemed like it was people's just commentary 
of of how they wore it and how they felt about wearing corsets and crinolines and stuff like that. So, um, so I, yeah, I didn't read the whole thing either. <laughs> All right. So t this is time now I'm done. I'm nobody else is talking to me. Um, so yes, remember to donate to us for our event, um, next year. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of ritual Versailles and I hope, and I will see you guys at the fashion walk for one. And then I'll see you again and glamour glamour tonight. So have fun at the rest of virtual Versailles, everyone. Thank you.